Why did dragons, who had the power to change the history of Middle-earth, never appear again after the First Age, with a few exceptions? Where did they go, and why didn't they return? What deterred them from seizing or destroying Middle-earth? Or was Smaug truly the last of his kind? Hello everyone, and welcome to Middle-earth Tales. Today, we will first review the dragons known by name, and then explore answers to these questions. In the history of Middle-earth, though dragons hold a significant place, we only know the names of four and can specifically detail their deeds. The first and undoubtedly the most devastating to Melkor's foes, as well as being the progenitor of dragons, was Glaurung. Classified as an Uruloki or Fire Drake, Glaurung was devoid of wings and the capacity for flight. Nonetheless, his speed on land was formidable, and he would assail his adversaries with both his physical might and his fiery breath. Glaurung was instrumental in Melkor's efforts to break the Elven Siege, wreaking havoc in the Battle of Sudden Flame and the Battle of Unnumbered Tears. Only the dwarves, protected by their fireproof armor, had the courage to face him directly. During the Battle of Unnumbered Tears, a dwarf inflicted a wound on him, compelling his withdrawal. After Melkor dispersed his enemies, Glaurung took command of the orc forces, marching southward and leading to the fall of the elven realm of Nargothrond. Remarkably, the demise of this dragon patriarch was by the hand of a mortal, Turin, who exploited Glaurung's sole weakness by striking his underbelly, thus ending the life of one of Melkor's most formidable lieutenants, second only to the Lord of the Balrogs, Gothmog. While Glaurung was known as the father of dragons, he was not the largest in stature. The title of the largest known dragon goes to Anka Lagan the Black. However, this massive creature did not have as much time to wreak havoc on Middle-earth as his ancestor did. He was the leader of the winged dragons and did not emerge until the War of Wrath. One might wonder why Melkor would withhold such a potent creature from earlier battles and keep him hidden in Angband. Two possibilities come to mind. First, they might not have reached their full maturity and power yet, and perhaps for this reason, they could not alter the course of the War of Wrath. The second possibility is that Melkor might have anticipated the Valar's eventual intervention against his dominion over Middle-earth and reserved Ankalagan as a secret weapon for such a confrontation. Regardless of Melkor's strategy, this huge dragon did not survive the conflict. He engaged in fierce combat with Thorindor, the Lord of the Eagles, and Arendil, only to be defeated and killed. It wasn't until the middle of the Third Age, approximately 5,500 years after the War of Wrath, that another dragon's name comes to our attention. This period is one clue to understanding what happened to the dragons in the interim. But let's now turn to the third dragon whose name we know, Skatha. Skatha was a serpent-like dragon, lacking both wings and legs. We have no information about Skatha's power or size, only that he dwelled in the Grey Mountains, plundered the treasuries of dwarves, and was ultimately slain by a man named Fram. It is said that the dragon population declined after Skatha's death, but 500 years later, they multiplied again and the War of the Dwarves and Dragons ensued, though no significant dragon from this conflict is named. And the last dragon we know by name, also the last dragon seen in Middle-earth, was Smaug. You are already familiar with everything about him, so there's no need for a lengthy explanation. When Smaug arrived at the Lonely Mountain, he was a young and mighty dragon. Yet, like the others, his end came at the hands of a human. I appreciate the consistency in some of Tolkien's themes. Just as anyone who slays a Balrog dies alongside it, the demise of all named dragons comes at the hands of humans. Glaurung by Turin, Ankalagon though assisted by Eagles, by Arendil, Skatha by Fram, and Smaug by Bard the Bowman. And according to Gandalf, Smaug was the last dragon whose fire was potent enough to melt a ring of power. So that answers our second question. 
is Smaug the last dragon in Middle-earth. While Smaug was the last dragon whose fire could melt a ring of power, he was not the last dragon to live. There were others, albeit evidently weaker than Smaug. After escaping the War of Wrath at the First Age's conclusion, some dragons retreated to the far north beyond the Grey Mountains into the vast, unexplored wastelands. While a number of them later migrated southward to the Grey Mountains engaging in conflicts with the dwarves, it's probable that many stayed in the northern hinterlands. What fate befell these dragons? And why was Smaug the sole dragon to journey southward? There were ample chances for them to move south and cause destruction akin to Glaurungs in Middle-earth. It could be that the trauma of narrowly surviving the First Age's final battle deterred them, or perhaps the rise of Sauron discouraged their southward migration. But especially the early Third Age would have offered a prime opportunity for their resurgence in Middle-earth, yet they abstained. What could be the reasons for this? The first possible answer to this question is that they lacked the motivation. Just like orcs, dragons, creations of Melkor, inherited traits from their maker. While orcs shared Melkor's hatred for everything the Valor created, dragons seemed devoid of this impulse. Instead, they seemed to have inherited Melkor's desire for possession. Even the father of dragons, who ventured south causing untold destruction, ultimately preferred to lay atop the treasures of Nargothrond. He had no intention of claiming these lands in Melkor's name. Similarly, Smaug, after seizing the Lonely Mountain and its treasures, did not immediately turn his attention to the nearby men of Dale or the Elven King's Hall in Mirkwood. As long as they didn't disturb him, neither elves nor men mattered to him. His sole desire was to sleep atop his treasure. Thus, the dragons hidden in the north had no ambition to fill the power vacuum left by Sauron to rule over or destroy those living there. However, there were still places worth seizing, such as Khazad Doom, with presumably significant treasures considering dwarven nature. So motivation alone does not fully answer our question. The second reason might be the dragons' low numbers and their difficulty in reproducing. In a previous video, I mentioned a dragon could still be considered young at 250 years. We know from the First Age that dragons reached their full potential late, and we have no information on how they reproduce or their rate of reproduction. If they could multiply as orcs do, the northern lands they fled to would not suffice, and they would be forced southward. Therefore, it's reasonable to surmise they faced population issues. Despite their immense strength, dragons were not indestructible. The dragons who fled like rats in the War of Wrath, seeing the mightiest of them and countless of their flying and crawling brethren slaughtered, must have been terrified of the Valar's fury. A full-scale invasion southward could risk drawing the Valar's ire again, potentially leaving them with no escape this time. This is, of course, my own reasoning. Even though we know dragons were highly intelligent, there's no evidence to suggest they possessed a collective consciousness. Therefore, the idea that dragons convened and decided, let's not go south to avoid the Valar's wrath, seems unlikely. Nonetheless, it's possible that the concept of the south being dangerous remained in the collective psyche of the dragons. Their choice to stay in the north and not descend to the south could also be attributed to the loss of their former grandeur over the millennia following their escape. Like other peoples, they may have weakened over time, possibly even regressing to a more primitive form of life. While a powerful dragon like Smaug did emerge, history in Middle-earth shows that figures capable of altering the course of events, like Aragorn, are exceptional. From this perspective, it wouldn't be incorrect to view Smaug not merely as representative of dragons, but as an extraordinary exception. The fact that Skatha was slain by a man of no extraordinary renown, and that the skirmish with the dwarves, though ultimately resulting in a loss for the dwarves, spanned two decades, indicates that the dragons left in the north likely did not possess Smaug's level of power. So combining all possibilities, 
the final verdict seems to be that dragons had no compelling reason to venture south. Their numbers had dwindled, they had lost their ancient splendor and power, and they likely feared the wrath of the Valar. Reflecting on the mysteries of Middle-earth and sharing these thoughts with you, while gaining new perspectives through your comments, is both fun and enlightening for me. I hope you find it as enjoyable as I do. If you have any theories about why dragons no longer made their presence known in Middle-earth, please share them. It would be wonderful to hear your thoughts. If you liked this video and my channel, don't forget to subscribe and like the video. After all, we need to keep YouTube happy, and it seems that's the way it likes it. Take care until we meet again.